Ala Murabit in this TED Talk speaks about how Islam and women's rights can go together. I disagree. Islam and feminism couldn't be more different. The International Human Rights Declaration, which you oppose because it wasn't written by religious scholars, well, those same principles are, are in our book. So really, the United Nations just copied us. When I was 15 in 2005, I completed high school and I moved from Canada, Saskatoon, to Zawiya, my parents' hometown in Libya, a very traditional city. Mind you, I had only ever been to Libya before on vacation. And as a seven-year-old girl, it was magic. It was ice cream and trips to the beach and really excited relatives. Turns out it's not the same as a 15-year-old young lady. I very quickly became introduced to the cultural aspect of religion. The words haram, meaning religiously prohibited, and aib, meaning culturally inappropriate, were exchanged carelessly, as if they meant the same thing and had the same consequences. And I found myself in conversation after conversation with classmates and colleagues, professors, friends, even relatives, beginning to question my own role and my own aspirations. And even with the foundation my parents had provided for me, I found myself questioning the role of women in my faith. So Canada is a nicer place for young women and even older women to live in? I agree. Canada and the West tends to be far better than most Muslim countries when it comes to women's rights. I wonder why. To a religious Muslim, haram means an additional consequence over and above how the society will judge you. It means God is also judging you. It means that what you're doing is forbidden in the religion and you may suffer consequences for it in the next life. Beautifying yourself in front of others, not allowed. Taking off your headscarf in front of men, uh-uh. Listening to music, no, no, no. Wearing perfume, haram. To many Muslims, a woman's role is at home, not working outside in a mixed gender society. How many women speakers have you seen at any Islamic conferences? Usually there's only a handful, if any. What about the mosques? Women are relegated to the back of the mosque, often without any actual involvement in the prayer ceremonies. In India, many masajid or mosques don't even have a women's area. In Canada, I've never seen this, but what I have seen is that most mosques, they have a quite dismal area for women. Often it's a tiny little area compared to the men's area. It doesn't have as good lighting or carpets, or sometimes it's completely segregated with only a video link to the men's side. Sometimes there's no barrier in between and sometimes there is. But often women are isolated completely from the ceremonies. And rule number one is do your research. So that's what I did. And it surprised me how easy it was to find women in my faith who were leaders, who were innovative, who were strong, politically, economically, even militarily. Khadija, radiallahu anha, financed the Islamic movement in its infancy. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for her. So why weren't we learning about her? Why weren't we learning about these women? Why were women being relegated to positions which predated the teachings of our faith? And why, if we are equal in the eyes of God, are we not equal in the eyes of men? Let me ask you, can we attribute the wealth and success of Khadija to Islam? She became prosperous and wealthy in pre-Islamic society, not under Islam. Her wealth was actually drained under Islam to finance her husband's prophetic career. 
Khadija is a best example of a pre-Islamic woman, not an Islamic one. Here's why. Islam puts many limitations on women, many of which didn't even exist in pre-Islamic Arabia. In Sunni Islam, it's reported in the Hadith that the best place for a woman to pray is in a house, and not just that, in the most isolated part of the house, the innermost chamber. She is not to be forbidden from going to the mosque, but later hadith indicate that the companions felt like if Muhammad was alive, he would have said women are forbidden from going to the mosques because of how the society had degraded in their eyes. There are also hadith forbidding women from traveling alone without a mahram, a male relative. To me, it all came back to the lessons I had learned as a child. The decision maker, the person who gets to control the message, is sitting at the table. And unfortunately, in every single world faith, they are not women. Religious institutions are dominated by men and driven by male leadership, and they create policies in their likeness. And until we can change the system entirely. Then we can't realistically expect to have full economic and political participation of women. Our foundation is broken. My mom actually says you can't build a straight house on a crooked foundation. So. The Islamic foundation is broken. It gives women half of the inheritance that a brother will receive. It doesn't allow women to divorce their husbands. They have to request the husband to, to let them go, or they have to give back the mahar, the bridal gift, or they have to go to the judge and ask for a khola, an annulment of their marriage. A man can simply utter the word talak and wait the waiting period, and the marriage would be over. The woman has no such right. I'm going to read a quote from you in pre-Islamic Arabia. The women in the pre-Islamic time, or some of them, had the right to dismiss their husbands, and the form of dismissal was this: if they lived in a tent, they turned it around so that if the door faced east, it now faced west. And when the man saw this, he knew that he was dismissed and did not enter. This is Isfahani in Hoyland, page one thirty. In two thousand and twelve and two thousand and thirteen, my organization led the single largest and most widespread campaign in Libya. We entered homes and schools and universities, even mosques. We spoke to 50,000 people directly and hundreds of thousands more through billboards and television commercials, radio commercials and posters. And you're probably wondering how a women's rights organization was able to do this in communities which had previously opposed our sheer existence. I used scripture. I used verses from the Quran and sayings of the Prophet. Hadiths, his sayings, which are, for example, "The best of you is the best to their family." Do not let your brother oppress another. For the first time, Friday sermons led by local community imams promoted the rights of women. They discussed taboo issues like domestic violence. Policies were changed. Do you ever see mullahs going out and protesting? That women need to mo have more rights, or that women need to have the the ability to divorce, or that children should not be married. No, it's the exact opposite. You find the religious authorities, the mullahs, and the and the scholars were protesting when people try to reform. When a country tries to reform and to ban child marriage, it's often the religious authorities were against it. They claim that because Muhammad married a child. We cannot prevent such a thing, even in today's world. Now, of course, not all Muslims be believe this, but we don't find the religious authorities tend to be the ones who are out there protesting and saying, "Look what the Quran and Sunnah says: women shouldn't be beaten, women shouldn't be allowed to be married without their consent." We don't find that. In certain communities, we actually had to go as far as saying. The International Human Rights Declaration, which you oppose because it wasn't written by religious scholars, well, those same principles are are in our book. So really, the United Nations just copied us. 
It's actually an insult to say that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which reaffirmed faith in fundamental human rights and dignity and worth of the human person and committed all member states to promote universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language or religion. It's an insult to say this was copied from Islam. It's an insult and it's ludicrous. Islam may emphasize that all races are equal, for example, when it, gave, it raised Bilal to the, to the rank that he was raised. But it has replaced racism with another type of religious classism, where believers at a higher rank than disbelievers, than the kuffar, and then and dhimis, and ex-Muslims, aka apostates, are the worst of all. They are sometimes even killed, right? Are gays welcome? No, gays are not welcome in Islamic societies and Muslim communities. Absolutely not. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a product of Enlightenment values, a document that was authored after World War II. Islam, on the other hand, is an archaic set of rulings and teachings based on what Muhammad went through in his life in the 7th century and the circumstances he lived in. Just about everything in Islam is arbitrary and based on what he experienced and what he wanted. For example, in Islam, it's forbidden to marry your suckling sister, uh, another lady who is not related to you but may have received breast milk from the same lady. Not only that, you can marry your cousin. Well, not only that, you can marry your adopted son's ex-wife. And then on top of it, Islam contains superstitions like evil eye and magic and claims these things are actual real things. Even positive statements like the best of you are those who are best to the wives are problematic because Muhammad also said, and I am best to my wives. Now, really? His wives were miserable. In the Quran itself, Allah threatened all his wives and said, I will replace all of you with better wives if you don't smarten up and stop complaining about your living conditions, right? How was he best to his wives? Is this the ideal situation where God himself has to come down and say, listen, you wives, if you don't smarten up, I'll replace you with better wives. And this is the best example for us? This is what we're supposed to look at? You can cherry pick and you can find positive things in Islam or in any religion to say that it's good for women. But on a whole, it's not. That's why we find over and over again, Islamic societies do not treat women well. That's why we find that we find these things because these things come from the teachings of Islam, from the documents, from the set of teachings that Muhammad came with. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to support me so I can continue making such videos, please check out my support page at abdullahsamir.com support. Even a few bucks can help out. It can help me to buy new equipment, purchase licenses for the software that I need and for the web hosting and for advertising and to keep food on the table for the family. I would love to do this more regularly, but it takes a lot of time and I also have a full-time job. Thank you so much to everyone who continues to support me, whether financially or otherwise, and stay tuned. Thank you everyone. This is Abdullah Samir, signing out.